Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, this is about the third or fourth trip I've made to Berlin, but the first thing I'm talking to, actually the second I've spoken to a student group here, and I was asked actually to do a bit of the, cover a bit of the content of debunking economics. So I've been talking a lot about the financial sector and the, and the failure of conventional economics to see the crisis coming and why they leave money, banks and debt out of their logic, but I'll, I'll do a bit of that towards the end. But the main thing I'm going to do now is to cover two points of critique uh, that they're in, in debunking, one of which I regard as an own goal. I'm sure an audience like us, they don't need to explain what an own goal is, but a really classic own goal in economics, which is trying to explain the phenomenon which I concede is, a, is a objectively normally the case that if the price of a good falls, demand for it will rise. And speaking recently at the Rethinking Economics Conference in, uh, in New York, I was on a panel with Deirdre McCloskey, who's a progressive neoclassical economist, one of the best way to describe her position. And I mentioned this particular critique, and she said to me, oh, yes, Steve, but surely you're not trying to tell me that, uh, you know, prices, uh, if, if price rises, demand's going to rise as well for most goods. And I, I was so taken aback by her riposte to this particular comment that I didn't follow up properly. But what she was saying was effectively the same thing a Ptolemaic astronomer would say, uh, surely, Copernicus, you're not saying the sun doesn't rise in the morning. What Copernicus is saying, well, you say it does rise, but your theory about why it does is wrong. So what I want to go through is this whole question about neoclassical theory, the way they try to explain the relatively real, realistic stylized fact that for most commodities, if price rises, demand will fall. So they think they've got an explanation, and they, they do have one for a single consumer. And this is what you get taught in the textbooks. I'm assuming you're all victims of economics at some stage? If you've all done an economics course? OK. Well, you, have to, you get taught, if the, if the teaching is comprehensive, you get taught how to derive a downward sloping curve for an individual consumer. And then you're suddenly shown a market demand curve as if there's no issue in going from one to the other. Um, but there's the way you derive the, 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 the model of a downward sloping demand curve for a single consumer is saying is ignoring the reality, again according to the theory, that relative prices also set incomes. If we're all producers of commodities, including labour, then changing the price of commodities, of course also include including labour, changes incomes. But yet when you draw that diagram to do the, for the working out the demand for an individual, you start by saying you can vary prices without varying the income of the consumer. And you're told that's okay because you're working with an isolated consumer. Well when you work with a general model, when you go beyond an isolated consumer and say, can we now apply this to a whole market or a whole economy full of many different individual markets, you can no longer make that assumption that you can change prices without changing incomes because you've got a general model, not a, not a partial equilibrium model, but a general one. So have you all seen what are called indifference curves? Anybody not seen them? Oh, dear. OK, you have. Right. OK, well, it's supposed to... Be supposed to be a way of modelling an individual's taste between two commodities. What I've got here is all other commodities on the vertical axis and bananas on the horizontal axis. And what I'm showing is the same income and then three different relative prices for bananas where bananas get progressively cheaper and three quantities that individuals will choose to maximise their utility. And you can then, from that, derive a downward sloping market, an individual demand curve, which I said is OK for a single consumer. But when you have more than one consumer, then prices, because they're the sources of incomes, you can't ignore what's going to happen to income. So any intelligent neoclassical economist thinking about this realise that, OK, there is an issue of going from considering a single individual to considering, considering a group of individuals, a group, a group of, in, a, in, a, in an economy consisting of lots of goods, where selling those goods was the source of income for those consumers. The first person to consider this was an economist called Gorman, and he actually published the first paper on this the year I was born, 1953. Okay, that's how long ago this issue was first considered. So you have many consumers and many goods, and you change the price for one commodity, you're changing the incomes and the distribution of income between all consumers. So the budget constraint, which is what you apply to drive that down with my sloping curve for a single individual, doesn't apply is a fixed point anymore when you have more than one consumer and more than one commodity, and then you're trying to derive a market demand curve for a single good in that economy. 
So the question was, under what conditions will the market demand curve have the properties of the individual demand curve? And the answer is known by the name of the three authors who are most associated with it. This Gorman beat them all to it, but they rediscovered this issue about 20 years later. Sonnenschein, Mantell and Debreu. Have you heard any of those names? Debreu most likely you've heard of. Okay. Okay. Now, the law of demand, as it's called, and it's one of these things that economists love calling laws. I think the only, only set of laws that are broken more often than laws in economics are traffic laws. <laughs> nobody drives at the speed of the traffic and nobody obeys any laws in economics. But that law is that if you reduce the price, demand necessarily rises. This is what's called a Hicksian compensated demand curve. And the answer they found was that no, it doesn't apply. Okay? The general answer is that no... Uh, and this is the expressed best by, by Sonnenschein in this particular paper. He says, we prove that every polynomial, okay, so anything you can draw as AX plus BX squared plus CX cubed, etc., etc., is an excess demand function for some specified commodity in some end commodity economy. Now, what they wanted to find was that if you were going to use a polynomial to describe the curve, which, of course, is a common exercise in mathematics then the coefficients would have to have such a value that the slope of, the, of that curve would be negative. Increased price, decreased demand. Decreased price, increased demand. They wanted a negative relationship there. And they found, no, any polynomial you care to mention, which could look like a, you know, any, anything other than a coiled-up snake, could be a demand curve. and have any polynomial shape at all. And what that means is you can't even derive the properties of a single market demand curve from the properties of a single consumer. And yet what economics does all the time is what I've seen described as radical constructivism. Now that is the idea you can build up everything at the macro level by in examining the properties of one of the micro entities. And yet this is a classic case where conventional economic theory proved that was impossible. So, what's going on here? Well, you, what, the, what they're saying effectively, if you had, say, Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday on their island, and you had downward sloping market individual demand curves for both, those in, for both those individuals for the commodity you're looking at, your market demand curve could look like that. Now, you, you may have heard of the concept of, emer of emergent properties. Ever heard that discussed? Okay. That's the argument that in, interactions of many entities can lead to behaviour at a group level which doesn't, can't be seen at the individual level. And that's normally left out of economics completely. But ironically, I think the, probably the best proof of what is actually involved here comes from economics. And I see this as an accidental proof by contradiction. Now, the way the proofs proceeded wasn't quite like this, but this is the best way to understand it. You start off by assuming that the market demand curve does obey the law of demand. So you assume the market demand curve is downward sloping. Then you derive conditions under which that's true. And they, you find they contradict the initial assumptions you made. And therefore they don't obey. Have you all seen the proof of, for example, showing the square root of 2 is not a rational number? Have you seen that proof at all? I had it in here, but I thought it was a bit heavy for a mundane evening. <laughs> okay. But that's basically, you start off by assuming that A over B equals the square root of 2. Okay, so you're assuming there are two integers whose ratio is exactly equal to the square root of 2. So you've got A over B equals the square root of 2. That's your beginning assumption. You assume they exist. Then you square both sides. You have A squared over B squared equals 2. And then you also, you also assume that A and B are the smallest integers for which this applies. Okay? So A over B have no common factor apart from 1. Okay? But once you've got A squared over B squared equals 2, you multiply across by B squared and you've got a squared equals 2 times b squared. Okay? Then you can make a substitution for a and then find out ultimately you get that a and b have the factor 2 in common. But you assume they didn't. So you've proven that the square root of 2 is an irrational number by assuming that it is and then contradicting your assumption. This was how irrational numbers were first discovered by the Pythagoreans who had the quite strong, effectively religious belief that all numbers were the ratio of two integers. And the first person to prove this, who proved it with the square root of 5, as it happens, working with a polygon, uh, his present, his prize for, for proving that was to be drowned in the Mediterranean by his fellow, by his fellow Pythagoreans. Neoclassical economists had a similar, similar reaction here. So they take a, an individual with a well-behaved 
utility function and you vary the price to get this the, the initial law of a single individual take this individual and vary the prices as I've shown you a moment ago while keeping everything else constant including their income and then you derive, derive a downward sloping demand curve but you've got the complication here that they're with the lower prices their welfare is actually higher so you want to now go from that to saying I want to m make sure that the in the, in the, sorry, I've jumped ahead of myself a bit there. When you have this type of situation, John Hicks pointed out that it's possible you might get a, a backward sloping uh, demand curve, so one that's sloped up rather than sloped down, because the income effects of moving from here to here might outweigh the substitution effects for something which is really undesirable. So, for example, if, if, uh, if haggis gets cheaper, people eat less haggis. You know what haggis is? Okay, you don't want to eat it. Okay. Now, so you, the, the assumption here in this particular proof is to start off, first of all, saying you can vary prices without varying income. So that point doesn't move. And then secondly, you can also change income and compensate for the substitution effect. So to get away from the possibility of a falling price in haggis, meaning you eat less haggis because you've got more to spend your income on and more desirable commodities. My apologies to any Scots, Scotsmen who watch this, watch this profile. I think I've been to Glasgow, so I'm safe from being lynched there at the moment. That's good. Okay. Uh, is that you can perfectly compensate for the income effect by moving those demand curves back to make them all uh, touch the one indifference curve. And having done that, you now have the outcome that a Hicksian compensated individual demand curve necessarily slopes down, and that's the law of demand. So you've got that stuff. Now, the SMD research is saying, can this actually apply at the aggregate level? And it won't, because changing prices change the distribution. And the, the impact on that change means that you can drive any curve you like by the same procedure. But let's start by assuming that it does apply. Okay, so we're saying, let's assume it does apply. But let's set up the conditions. First of all, to have two or more consumers, each consumer has to have a different source of income, to some extent and different tastes. Otherwise, you'd be dealing with a single person. So you can't just say everybody's got the same income and the same taste. You're effectively cloning everybody. And tastes also have to change with income because if you don't have taste changing with income, then effectively we're all eating spam. If I can go to a Monty Python line instead. Okay. So you've got to have some variation, some income effect has to turn up. So let's consider a two-consumer, two-commodity world where Rob Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday are your two individuals, and coconuts or bananas, typical things you'll find on a desert island, are your two commodities. Crusoe owns the bananas, Friday owns the coconuts, coconuts are the necessity, bananas are the luxury, and Friday has a higher preference for coconuts than Crusoe has. Okay? That sets up a nice little combination of all those assumptions. And you start with some arbitrary price ratio. So here's the coconuts versus bananas, here are the indifference curves of the two consumers. You choose some uh, relative arbitrary, uh, relative price level. You keep the aggregate income constant, so you don't change the number of banana trees and the number of coconut trees, but you consider a lower price for bananas. Drop that down, and what's going to happen is Crusoe's income is going to fall because bananas are now cheaper. Okay? Friday's income is going to rise because coconuts are relatively more expensive. But the market demand for bananas can fall because of the lower price, because Crusoe's income has fallen to begin with, Friday's income rises, but Friday doesn't like bananas as much as Crusoe does. So in that particular case, by dropping the, the price of bananas, you can actually drop demand for them as well. Then if you want to keep relative prices constant and increases in, increase incomes equally, so you start from here, and you then move that price ratio out, so you're basically increasing the number of coconut trees and banana trees on the island, you move it out, well, the demand for bananas will rise more because it's the luxury. And Crusoe's income also rises more than Friday's. So you can't compensate for the income effect either. So a uniform increase in income alters the distribution of income because you change what the income's spent on and that changes who gets the income. So you can't get rid of the, first of all, the price effect 
can cause perverse outcomes because of its effect on income, in, income distribution. And then the income effect can cause perverse outcomes because of the effect of prices on distribution of income. So what you get out of that is you can't avoid, you, you don't get the law of demand anymore. All those compensations disappear. So the only way to get around it is to assume that all consumers have identical tastes, which means there's only one consumer. And you also have to assume that tastes don't change with income, which means there's only one commodity. So you've contradicted your starting assumption of two consumers with different tastes and two different commodities. Now that's really what was done in the theorem. So it's proof by contradiction that you cannot derive the law of demand for a market demand curve. Now rather than acknowledging that, rather than acknowledging it and saying, hell, we can't actually work with demand curves anymore or our theory doesn't actually explain why market demand uh, falls as price rises, um, they have instead pretended that everything is OK. And they teach, this is what they teach you. Okay? They don't even discuss, in most undergraduate textbooks, the transition from the individual proof which they can do to the aggregate one which they can't do. When this is more valid... Mathematically, that's, that's, that's false to assume that's the outcome. That's correct, which is not what you see in your textbooks. So the proper response would be to say, well, we can't guarantee downward-sloping demand curves, so we can't actually do supply and demand analysis. Oh, damn, yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. We don't take that seriously. Let's go and do something else. Of course, what they'd rather do is stick exactly with that same old stuff. They continue, and it's like the Pythagoreans finding that you know, the square root of, of five is an irrational number, and therefore forever banning anybody to draw, any, draw polygons anymore, or draw you know, right-angled triangles where uh, we have uh, two, two of the sides are one. No can do. And Sonnenschein and Schaefer, in what's called the Handbook of Mathematical Economics, are quite honest about this statement, convoluted in how they state it, but nonetheless honest. Saying market demand functions need not satisfy in any way the classical restrictions which, which characterise consumer demand functions. So the importance of the above results is clear. Strong restrictions. Now, what those strong restrictions do, do are, are equivalent to, uh, for example, as I mentioned for analogy, banning the use of irrational numbers okay, in mathematics. That would be the same equivalent sort of assumptions that mathematicians would need to avoid the result they found two and a half thousand years ago. But economists say strong restrictions. The correct result is say, we can't do it. And the, the only really, I think, not just honest but intelligent response to this was by Alan Kerman some decades ago when he said, we may have to abandon the idea that we should start from the isolated individual. We may instead have to work at the level of groups that have socially cohesive behaviour like capitalist workers and bankers, or landlords and rentiers and so on, which was the classical approach, working in terms of social classes. That's what should have been done. But uh, instead, what you get are dishonest statements in postgraduate text and outright nonsense in some of the academic papers. So my favourite here was Varian. Has anybody read Varian? No. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, it is sometimes convenient to think of the aggregate demand as the demand of some representative consumer. Now, you know how mathematical that book pretends to be. Okay. He then says, the conditions under which this can be done are rather stringent, but a discussion of this issue is beyond the scope of this book. Yeah. Or in other words, trust me, I'm an economist. Yeah, okay. That's the 87 version. Now, what I found really funny, looking through, being an author, you do go back and edit your text occasionally and find better words to express what you mean. But I love this. I found in the second edition, he wrote, this demand function can in fact be rationalised by a representative consumer. Rationalised, even though it's got the word rational in it, you know you're bullshitting yourself when you say <laughs> rational, OK? What does he change it to in the third edition? Generated. That's better. That'll be harder for the students to figure out. You know? And it's even worse than the undergraduate text. And I've, I had a few of them. I actually asked my students one year to go through and see if they could find where this issue was discussed, and they came up with some lovely examples. But Paul Samuelson took the cake, I thought. 
and this is in his 2010 and 19th edition of his book and here he says the market demand curve is found by adding together quantities demanded by oil individuals at each, each price he said does the market demand curve obey the law of downward sloping demand it certainly does authoritative Samuelson I've seen this guy present once by the way He's quite a, he was quite a brilliant uh, presenter and this is a bit of a cameo I was the second year I think second year or third year at university and he turned up to our university to give a seminar just to the professors so myself and a couple of friends went around putting up a sign Paul Samuelson will speak in such and such a lecture theatre at such and such a time exactly the same time as a seminar to shame the professors into having him talk to the student body that was good fun so he turned up, professors all queued into the front row with a couple of seats, and I was sitting in, in the middle of the rows with the mathematics lecturer, Tony, Tony Phipps, very good bloke. And I'd done mathematics the year before, so I was fairly au fait with maths. And Samuelson was rushing through stuff on the board, very, very colourful, and saying he was giving a, a model of general equilibrium, like his gran- if, he's had to, if his grandmother asked, what's this general equilibrium? Here's the model he'd tell his grandmother. And Tony and I are watching and seeing the maths going up on the board. And at one point I said, that didn't look right to me. And Tony said, yeah, but it's Samuelson. They must know what he's doing. He said, oh, OK, all right. Don't think so, but... And then he goes on for another half a board and suddenly says, oh, to the professors in the front row, I made a mistake back there. You should have corrected me. He deliberately made the error to catch him out. So he did. Anyway, here's him, him saying to students now that this... Actually, a false argument. He's saying that, no... The market demand curve does slope down, no problem at all. And the reason is, even though it's a provably false statement, he thought he'd proved it correct. And I got the inkling out of this by taking a look in, what's it called, uh, Mass Have you seen that tome? You, you know, it's great for propping up a monitor, I find. Um, but in, in Mass I, I found that it's actually referenced this paper by Samuelson. And it's simply bizarre when you look at it. And this is why I recommend you to read the journals. Don't trust the textbooks. Go and read the journals. Because here he was talking about the whole issue, which, which was Gorman's way of, of portraying the problem. Can you use a set of indifference curves to describe an entire country? And he says, what defence do we make on using that? And he said, we might claim, here we go, that our country is inhabited by a number of identical individuals with identical tastes. He said, they must also have identical initial endowments of goods. So all the stuff I've mentioned to you right right here. Okay, he's admitting all that quite happily. And he says, now that's not too unrealistic, but it's a slight improvement over Robinson Crusoe. This is why I use Robinson Crusoe in my example. But he then continued saying, well, how can we actually derive it? And he said, well, you can't get an indifference curve for an entire community, but maybe you can for a family. And this is no joke. This is in a, published in a, in a refereed journal. Since blood is thicker than water, the preferences of the different members of that family are interrelated by what we might call the consensus of social welfare function, which takes into account the deservingness or ethical worth to the consumption level of each member of the family. Sound like your family? <laughs> Mine's pretty decent, actually, but even I wouldn't pretend this for my family. In, it said, family acts as if it were maximising their joint welfare function. Income must always be reallocated among the members of the family society so as to keep the marginal social significance of every dollar equal. OK, are you, so, are you with me? OK, it gets better. He then assumes the entire American economy is one big happy family. <laughs> That's why they go shooting each other all the time. So the same argument will apply to all of society if optimal reallocations of income can be assumed to keep the ethical worth of each person's marginal dollar equal. I mean, I just looked at that and I basically... And he then said, rigorous proof is given. So I actually thought he'd proved it by making all these assumptions. And, you know, America's one big happy family. All I've got to ask, what the hell was he smoking? You know? Was he a zombie or just a stone person? It's beyond belief. But this is the sort of stuff they swallow. And they, they pump it down your throats as well, without, of course, being as honest as Samuelson is there. And Mas Kalel and he's talking about it, he says, we can compute meaningful measures of aggregate welfare using the same techniques as individuals if there's a fictional individual whose, whose utility-maximising problem is exactly the same as the entire economy's. 
so that we can find that individual out there whose tastes are exactly the same as the whole society, there's no social conflict, no class conflict, everybody's happy about everything, etc., etc. Again, like I said, I'd love to find where they get their drugs. So that, that's their world. And what I did in, in writing Debunking Economics, I didn't expect to add any critique of my own. The one thing I did put in there was my critique of the labour theory of value because I knew that I'd be typecast by some critics as being anti-capitalist, so I thought I'd have a go at my, my personal critique of Marx's theory of value as well, just to shut that particular argument up, because it didn't matter, they, they didn't even look at it. But I did, by accident, discover a flaw in the theory of the Marshallian theory of competition. And to begin with, you all learn this thing about a rising marginal cost curve. Now, just recently, a leading post-Keynesian economist, Fred Lee, unfortunately died very young of cancer at the age of 65. Fred made it his life campaign to keep alive the empirical research of about over 100 research papers, 100 of which have found that at least 89% and normally about 95% of firms, when you query them, report declining marginal cost, constant order declining, not rising. Okay? So the empirical research doesn't support the model at all. But Milton Friedman wrote his classic paper about methodology to stop people reading those papers. Because he said, if you ask billiard players how they manage to sink billiard balls, what they're actually doing is solving complicated versions of Newton's equations. But that's not what they'd tell you if you asked them. He said, you could actually make excellent predictions of what they would do by saying they did know those formulas and did solve them. Uh, and it's not because they actually do that, but because if they didn't do something the same as that, they wouldn't be excellent billiard players. And he used the same argument for uh, firms to say that unless firms act, behave as if they're equating marginal cost and marginal revenue, they're not going to be profit maximisers. Okay? So he's saying we don't have to ask firms what they do. We know what they do because if they don't do it, they're not going to maximise profit. So don't bother reading those papers saying that firms don't face rising marginal cost which is a different issue again, by the way. Okay? But the theory made sense. You'd need to show what profit maximising is given falling marginal cost. But anyway, you're saying firms don't cons consciously set marginal cost equal to marginal revenue, but unless they did that, they wouldn't maximise profits. Now, one nice thing about the modern world is you can test this with a computer simulation. I did the proof before I worked out this little simulation, but you can set up a textbook market demand curve you can assume that firms are a bit like the billiard players. They don't have any... They're not solving calculus here. They're simply varying output, seeing what happens to profit. If profit rises, they continue moving in the same direction. If profit falls, they change in the opposite direction. That's all my simple, what I call instrumentally rational, profit maximisers do. So they choose some output level at random, choose some amount to vary uh, their output also at random, vary their output, keep on varying it in the same direction if profit goes up, reverse direction of profit goes down, and just see what happens. And do they behave as Milton Friedman predicts they would? Well, these are my functions. I've got a linear demand curve. I've got quadratic marginal cost, and therefore I've got a linear marginal revenue function. And I give... If you look in the textbooks, have a, have a look at your textbook and check and see what sort of industry they have as their example of a competitive industry. It'll be something like some kid on a corner selling lemonade. Okay, it's never based on empirical data because they can't find a firm that matches their theory. But they make up these examples with toy quantities like 10, you know, 10 cups of lemonade a day and nonsense like that. Well, I, I use values here which give me big numbers. Okay? And so I can get decent predictions. So I have a, a market demand curve falling to zero if you produce, what is that... Uh, 8, 8, 8 billion units of whatever we're talking about, something seriously large, and a, a zero a price of if a price is 800, then demand is zero, and the theory predicts that monopoly will produce at this point, and 100 firms will produce at that point. So I then set up an industry, an artificial uh, economy with that level of output. Start with the one firm and see what the one firm does. Does it actually converge here, and then see where two firms, three firms, four firms, etc actually go to. And the program uh, it might look a bit complicated. This is in a package called MathCAD that I, I like because it states the math mathematics explicitly. So it's a very simple uh, multi-agent array model here. So I start with a monopoly and the move out to having up to 100 firms in the model. 
I have an initial output set at random for each firm. I think at an initial price, given that initial output level. Each firm then chooses an amount to vary its output by, either up or down. Then for a large number of runs, and normally I run for a 1,000 iterations, you work out what the new market output level is, work out what the new market price is, and then any firm whose profit goes up continues moving the same way, any firm whose profit goes down changes direction. And you then see what, what happens out of the whole, whole simulation. So when I run it, what I get is this prediction of the more firms, the higher the output and the lower the price. Conventional theory and argument in favour of competition. And in particular, monopoly output will be less than price will be higher than if you have, say, 100 firms in the industry. So, here's a graph over a 1,000 iterations with three randomly chosen firms. The average, the prediction I make for firms for the output level per firm, and the neoclassical prediction. There's the neoclassical prediction of output per firm. There's my prediction. There are three randomly chosen firms out of the entire 100 in the sample, and the black line is the average, which over a 1,000 iterations converges pretty close to my prediction. Now, you might think, well, maybe the firms aren't profit maximising. Maybe the algorithm I've got doesn't get them to choose a maximum profit. Nope. In fact, they make more profit than the neoclassical model says they'll make. Here's the profit levels. There's the neoclassical level prediction of profit per firm. There's my prediction. There are three randomly chosen firms that all happen to get a higher level of profit. Uh, and there's the actual level of the 100 firms in the industry. So the theory is wrong in two fronts. Firms don't equate marginal cost to marginal revenue, and they make a higher profit than if they did do it. So there's something wrong with the theory. And when you actually take a look at it, there's the theory prediction, there's the monopoly level of output, there's supposedly 100 firms. In, other, in fact, when I run the simulation, they're pretty much the same spot. Okay. Competitive firms with the same cost structure and the same demand curve, same output level. So, what's going on there? This is also this looking, uh, going from between zero firms and 100 firms. There's the neoclassical prediction, rising output as the number of firms increases. There's my prediction, no change. There's the result of those simulations, bouncing around my no change argument. And the profit, uh, the price level, I'm predicting a higher price. Neoclassical theory predicts a falling price. There's the actual outcomes. So the problem is that equating marginal cost to marginal revenue does not maximise profits. It's a provably wrong formula. And this is also because the demand curve for an individual firm can't be horizontal. You're taught fallacy after fallacy. But uh, I'll go through the, the simple one. What used to be the way this was described when I did micro was they said the firms were atomistic. You ever heard that expression? I doubt that you have. It's dropped out of the textbooks. But the argument was that firms behave like atoms who don't care what other atoms do. So they simply choose an output level for their own profit maximising. They don't strategically interact with other, other firms in the industry. Now, the modern theory also has what's called Corno and Bertrand competition, where they are supposed to strategically guess what other firms will do before they make, decide what they're going to do, so they do interact. And the Corno theory is reasonably correct. But the argument that the, market, the individual demand curve for a single firm is horizontal is not only false, it's been known to be false since 1957. And again, this is something I didn't realise until after I wrote the first edition of Debunking Economics, because a very conservative quite, and, and quite aggressive neoclassical economist called George Stigler was invited to write a survey paper on perfect competition back in 1957 or 56 by the Journal of Political Economy, published as the first paper in the journal for 1957. And in that, he said, what's the slope of the... Uh, what, what's marginal revenue for an individual firm? Well, that's how much its revenue change is given a change in its output and expanded out to being price plus output of that firm multiplied by the slope of the market demand curve 
time how much market output change given a change in output by the single firm, where this last term is 1. So what he concluded is that the marginal, that the slope of the market, the, indiv the individual firm's demand curve is exactly the same as the market demand curve. Not what you get taught today, is it? Now this is, a, again, a lot of what's been, this is another own goal in this sense, because a lot of the stuff is done by critics like me and journals neoclassicals don't even know exist, let alone read. But this is a leading journal and a lead article by a leading neoclassical who was one of the main opponents of all the people doing empirical research, just as Milton Friedman was. So it's something which should be known. Now, the graphical intuition is simple. If you have a market demand curve which slopes down, and I've already shown you they can't even prove that, and you take point of P, of P where Q is the price, Q the input of the quantity and P the price, and then have Q plus DQ over here, and P minus DP, there's your overall slope. If you have a little q and a tiny change in output caused by that individual firm, that little segment's going to slope down just like the rest does. Unless you've gone some way of arguing that one firm interacts with another and stops that happening. So the slope of the demand curve facing the individual firm is exactly the same as the market demand curve. Now, how come it doesn't turn up that way in the textbooks. How do they look like the horizontal? Well, it's really simple. You just apply a little thing called magic. <laughs> and we all know what magic is. It's distracting you. Okay? It's doing something completely feasible while hiding how it's done from you, so you think it's done by something in incredible. And what you do is, the magic is you visually zoom in on the horizontal axis, the quantity axis, while taking the entire range of price at the same time. So this is how you can do it. There's a downward slapping market demand curve, and I'm going to zoom in on that bit. So I zoom in on that bit. Oh, it's flatter. Okay, let's do it again. I zoom in on that bit, and I get that. I'm almost there. Keep on going, and I finally get what looks like a totally flat line. What if I zoom in on both price and quantity? So rather than zooming on the on only one axis, I zoom in on a rectangle. And notice I'm using the graphs of the program here to force myself to have the same shape each time. So I zoom in there. That's what I get. If I do it again, if I zoom in on that bit, I get that bit. Do it again on this little bit here, I get that bit. Now I'm getting down to the scale of individual firm. They're still seeing a downward sloping demand curve. So you're distracted. Okay? It's a trick. I don't know that they're conscious of the trick, but that's why it works. So you have marginal revenue must be less than price for individual firms, can't be the same. Demand curve for a single firm can't be horizontal. So they've been teaching a fallacy for 40 years. Actually, when I wrote, it was 40 years when I wrote it. It's going on more than 50 years now. So can you justify the standard tuition? Well, Stigler thought he found a way out in 1957 because he took that marginal revenue for the ith firm and he converted it to a form formula including the number of firms in the industry and the elasticity of market demand. And he then said, we will converge to better competition as, output, as the number of firms rises. So he took this term. This is the, how much, this is the change in the revenue for the ith firm. And he then introduced P over P times Q over Q, so you're not changing anything. So I've now taken this last term and multiplied P over P and Q over Q, then call the output of the I firm big Q market output divided by N, the number of firms in the industry, bring that term in here, rearrange the P's and Q's, which is a cute expression in English, and finally you've got this expression... where now you have the market, the elasticity of market demand, or 1 over the elasticity of market demand. So having done all that, you can finally say that the marginal revenue for the ith firm is market price plus market price divided by the number of firms in the industry multiplied by the elasticity of market demand. And he said, to quote Stigler, this last term goes to zero 
as the number of firms rises indefinitely. So economists, and only a minority of neoclassicals, are aware of this paper by Stigler. Okay. But those who are, they use this way out. And I know that from personal experience because I had a paper rejected from the American Economic Review on this basis. And Stigler's argument is correct. There's only one problem with it. Equating marginal revenue and marginal cost is an essential part of the theory, and that's not profit-maximising behaviour. I'll show you what the actual profit-maximising formula is. So the neoclassical argument, you get told in the textbooks, equate your marginal cost to your marginal revenue, you'll maximise your profits, which is solving what you can call an ordinary differential, which is finding, you're finding the derivative of profit relative to your output and finding where that derivative is zero. And you're told that'll maximise your profit. But your profits don't depend just on what you do. They depend upon what other firms in the industry do, even if you can't control them, even if you don't know what they're doing, even if you um, don't strategically interact with them. So your real profit maximising rule is solving a total differential. And that's finding out whether the derivative of your profit is zero relative to total industry output, even though you can't control it. Now again, I got told when I first suggested this argument, that, well, they can't know that. Well, yes, they can, because the problem, if you imagine some uh, fat capitalist telling uh, a manager to work out how to maximise profits, and by the way, the whole idea of a profit maximising of output is nonsense anyway. The simple explanation for that is, imagine if you worked in a, a firm and there was actually a profit maximising level, the job of the sales manager would be ring up the sales staff and say, stop selling, we've just reached a profit maximising level of output. Think anybody has ever made that phone call? Okay. You simply try to sell more. That's all you try to do. But anyway, so you have... Here's the, the out question from the boss. And the economist says, well, that's pretty easy. Equate marginal cost and marginal revenue. That's what I've been taught works in the textbooks, and they tell me the truth. The mathematician looks at it and says, oh, interesting problem. What I need to solve is, is set the total differential equal to zero. So let's see what happens with that. Well, the total differential is to find out where this expression is zero. How much does your revenue, cha pr pr revenue change given a change in total market output? Now, whereas the neoclassical formula is this one. How much does your profit cha change given a change in your output? Now, the total differential <coughs> involves working out the partial differential of your profit with respect to the output of each individual firm in the industry and then adding it up. So you have, to get this one, you've got to add up N of these. Where you're looking at the firm going from the first firm to the last firm in the industry, where once and only once that's going to be you. So that's the change in the I firm's profit given a change in output by the Jth firm. And you've got N terms like that in an industry with N, with, uh, N firms inside it. So using the product rule, I can take the revenue part of that and expand it out. So I've got price times the partial, partial DQI DQ, DQJ plus QI times partial DP DQJ. Now this bit is market price times how much a given firm's change in output causes you to change your output. Now because we're talking about firms that aren't reacting to each other, that's zero. Except, and only except, when we're talking about you. So for n minus 1 times, that's going to be 0. But once when the firm we're considering is you, that's going to be 1. So you get that reducing to p. This bit is your output, qi, multiplied by how much a given firm's change in output changes market price. Now, I've already seen from Stigler, that's the, market, uh, the slope of the market demand curve. So you're going to get n copies of QI times the slope of the market demand curve. And that'll give you the correct... When you equate that to marginal cost, that's the next thing. When you're looking at the cost component, that's how much does the your cost change given a change in output by another firm. That's zero every time except when you're considering your own output, when it therefore becomes your marginal cost. So the maximum profit is where P plus N, which is the number of firms in the industry, times the output of your firm times the market slope of the market demand curve minus your marginal cost equals zero. 
That's the true profit maximising point, and that's what my instrumental profit maximizers were finding just by that very simple uh, routine I, I put into that model. Whereas the neoclassical formula says it's price plus QI, time to slope at the market demand curve, minus your marginal cost, and they're missing an N. Now, N is very big. In the model I've given you, that when I had 100 firms, it's 100. Okay, it's not a small number. So they're actually teaching you a wrong formula for profit maximising anyway. Now, that's just two of the flaws in neoclassical economics. Okay? And to my way of thinking, I think it's the best analogy I can make for the state of neoclassical economics is it's like Ptolemy's theory of astronomy. It's got this equilibrium orientation that says the market economy reaches equilibrium, and it's proven that it can't, but it assumes you can reach equilibrium. Okay. It assumes it's a welfare maximising situation, and assumes any shocks will be disturbances that you rapidly return back to equilibrium again, and it assumes you can ignore the monetary system, which is a bit like saying, let's assume the Earth is the centre of the universe, and the moon and the sun and the stars and the planets orbit around us, and to explain the fact that the planets reverse direction, let's whack them on circles as well. And let's fine-tune the circle so you can fit the data. Ptolemy's system was actually a very, very close approximation of the actual motion of the planets. But it was a completely lunatic model of the world, the universe, as we now know. I see neoclassical economics in much the same state. And the area that I'm now focusing on, which is my own research interest, is the role of bank debt and money in the economy. And that's just going to be the, for a negative critique to somewhat of a positive one. Because, again, if you look at your macroeconomics, it doesn't even mention the role of banks in the macroeconomy. They're given no role at all. And you get somebody like Krugman, who gets the Nobel Prize for Economics, arguing that lending is just a case of banks intermediating between patient and impatient people. And therefore, you can ignore banks and debt and money when you're doing macroeconomics. And he had a, a go at me on his website about two years ago, which I woke up in the morning to find my name was the opening line in Paul Krugman's blog, which led to an interesting exchange for a couple of weeks, which I think you can still find on the, on the, on the web. But he said, I said that lending is an addition to demand. And he says, I, don't, I guess I don't get that at all. He said, if I decide to cut back on my spending and stash the funds in a bank, which lends them out to someone else, this doesn't have to represent a net increase in demand. And he says, it comes sometimes it will because of a propensity to spend. He says, Keane's saying something different, and he's not sure what. He said, I think it has to something to do with the notion that creating money equals creating demand. But again, that isn't right in any model I understand, which is a perfectly accurate statement. <laughs> so what he models is this idea of banking being a transfer from a patient person to an impatient person, <coughs> pardon me, where the bank is just a bystander that arranges the loan but doesn't actually originate the loan. So over the last couple of years, I've helped design a software package that lets me model monetary flows like that, that I call Minsky after Hyman Minsky. And it's showing lending using accounting standards of credit and debit there, by the way. If I was doing a talk just about Minsky, I'd spend more time explaining the mechanics there. But I can set up the vision of lending that Krugman has in both in his blog and also in an um, academic paper uh, where the bank arranges a loan from a consumer sector, which is the patient sector, to the investment sector and the bank charges an intermediation fee for doing it. Then I have both consumer sector and investment sector hiring workers, producing output, selling it, investing, etc., etc. And I show it in a balance sheet. Has anybody here studied accounting? Yeah, I didn't, but I've learned it, I'll learn it the hard way. I now realise its importance, I must admit. I didn't do it when I was at university. I don't know that I wish I did, because quite a bit of my friends found themselves living boring lives as accountants. But anyway, uh, so what I'm showing here is lending, uh, just a, a bit of a technical thing. Assets are shown as a positive. Liabilities and equity are shown as a negative, so all rows sum to zero. That's, that's what double entry bookkeeping does, so you make sure that all rows sum to zero. So lending, uh, in this case, is adding a positive sum to a negative amount, which reduces it, which means the bank's liability to the consumer sector falls, and the bank's liability to the investment sector rises, and that's the actual transfer of money between the two entities, seen from the point of view of the banking sector. 
and then the repayment is between those two agents, interest payments between the two, the consumer sector pays a fee to the banking sector, the consumer sector hires workers, the investment sector hires workers, the consumer sector invests, the, uh, sorry, the investment sector consumes, the consumer sector invests, workers consume, bankers consume and bankers invest. That's the basic structure of the model. And then I set up parameters for it in a simulation. Now notice there's no sign of debt there. And that's because we're looking at the economy from the point of view of the bank. And the debt is neither an asset nor the liability of the bank in Krugman's model. It's a liability of the investment sector and an asset of the consumer sector. So when I show the consumer sector, I now show the asset they have at the bank. Their bank deposit is a positive sum, because from their point of view, that amount of the money in the bank is an asset. The debt that the investment sector owes to them is another asset. And here's all the lending and repayment turning up here. Now, there's the, again the transfer of the lending reduces the cash they've got and increases the asset they have of the loan. So that's, that's the vision that, that you find in Krugman and, and also in most neoclassicals when they think about what banks do. So when I model it and say, does, does the, do banks matter? Because the conventional view of people like uh, Krugman is that you can ignore banks and macroeconomics except during a... Uh, a liquidity trap. That's one time he'll actually say, you've got to think about it. So pardon me, I've got a little bug in the software that I have to fix up there. Um, I made a mind Jasper in the back row. We've intrigued to find that's one more bug that's been removed um, in most recent workings. But if I simulate this model, and if I rapidly change the level of lending, so there's very little lending, we'll have a rapid increase in lending, and change the level of repayments, so debt soars, or reduce it drastically, so it plunges in the other direction and then restore it back to where we started again and take a look at what's happened to the economy in terms of what's happened to GDP which is further over here on a, on a high resolution screen I could show you that all at once but uh, we're lacking resolution there GDP, I've been simulating for 478 years in running that simulation and GDP has pretty much flatlined, a couple ups, a couple downs Okay, so the argument they make is that Banks are intermediaries, they just shuffle money between people, doesn't change the amount of demand in the economy, therefore, in macroeconomics, we can ignore banks' debt and money. Now, my argument has been, well, that's not actually the real world. The real world is that banks lend to non-banks. So what I do is, again, I've had a lot of time, I can actually do it live if you'd like me to do it later during, during the conversation, but I can simply, in about 30 seconds, I can shuffle this around in Minsky and make the loan an asset of the bank. Still a liability of the investment sector. It's now the bank that's doing the lending. And once I've done that, if I then do the same trick, and pardon me, I've got to resize these tables again. Let's see if it's actually a bit smaller now. Let's resize this one. And make it smaller. Okay, same model. If I now, let's see if I can drag it over a bit on the screen and make it more visual here so you can see GDP as I run the simulation. Now notice what's happening. GDP is actually rising because lending is creating more money. If lending slows down, GDP plunges. We have booms and slumps in the economy because of a change in the rate of creation of debt. It takes me 30 seconds to go from one vision to another. You go from one where debt doesn't matter, and when you can ignore banks and macroeconomics, to one where debts, banks and money are crucial. So that's another huge hole in economic theory. You're not being taught the role of the monetary system in any realistic sense. And that's why they didn't see the financial crisis coming. Now what I find amusing is seeing how they struggle to do the simplest possible thing of explaining why there are cycles in the economy. Because again, of this equilibrium fixation they have, they assume everything tends towards equilibrium. This is an extremely recent paper, July 2nd of this year, as you can see. And they state, there's a couple of some leading uh, French neoclassical economists saying, one of the remarkable conundrums in theoretical economics is the so-called business cycle. I.e. the very existence of cycles is a mystery. Why on earth do they happen? And they struggle through with a highly complicated paper and build a 
managed to generate cycles after a lot of labour. But with Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, which is the area that I've been doing my creative work in in economics for some decades now, Minsky began from the proposition that if you're going to explain capitalism, you've got to have a model in which Great Depressions can occur. If you haven't got a model which can generate a Great Depression, because they've happened in the past, not just the 1920s, but also the 1890s and the 1870s and 1850s and so on, because they have happened, then your model must be able to generate them, otherwise you don't have a model of capitalism. And he then said the natural starting point for looking at an economy is to take one with a cyclical past that is now doing well, but has a debt crisis in the recent past. So that is so simple to build on the basis of work of another non-orthodox economist called Richard Goodwin. And he said, well, roughly speaking, the amount of capital you have determines the output you're going to produce. Roughly speaking, that then output then determines the employment level. Employment determines the rate of change of wages. Output minus wages and interest payments gives you the amount of profit. Profit determines the amount of investment you want to uh, uh, cr create. And the gap between your desired investment and your actual profit determines the rate of change of debt. And investment is the rate of change of capital, which gets you back where you started again. It's a logical causal loop. And I can put that together in Minsky, my software package in Minsky again, and simulate it and see what happens. And not only do I get cycles, let's just make the scale a bit smaller again. So you can see debt over there as well. Not only do I get cycles coming out of it, the cycles also have somewhat the same shape as the crisis we've just been through, because for a while the cycles seem to diminish, which neoclassical economists, when it occurred in the real world, called that the great moderation and took credit for it. At the same time, we had a rising level of private debt to GDP. We also had increasing inequality, and what's going on here, the black line is workers' share of output. So workers are getting less, capitalists are getting the same amount, bankers are getting more. Does that sound familiar? Okay. That's what's going on. Then suddenly the cycles get more extreme. That period of declining volatility becomes rising volatility, and ultimately you get to the level where there's a total breakdown. And this is a model without the government to attenuate the whole system and without any changes in behaviour in response to all these changes in levels of debt and so on. But as a stylized model, it's pretty damn close to what actually happened in the, peri in the 2000 and period from 1990 to 2007. And this model and the insights it gave me is why when I saw the rising level of private debt in the economy, I expected a crisis. So here again is another reason why economics is not just a waste of time, but actually a dangerous waste of time. It, got, it, it persuaded policymakers and economists themselves to ignore the level of private debt. But if you look at the level of private debt and the change in private debt and see how it correlates to unemployment, you find correlations like that. This is from the Great Depression, from 1920 to 1940. The change in private debt correlates with the level of unemployment with the correlation coefficient of minus 0.78. Come forward to our current time, and there's the change in debt and the level of unemployment in America, and the correlation is minus 0.93 over the last 15 to 20 years. Now, you're told to ignore that. You're not told, here's the data, ignore it. You're not even shown the data. It's not even considered. But that seeing signals like that, because of my training in Minsky, is why I saw the crisis coming and I was one of the handful to warn of it. So we have an economics which is empirically unrealistic, logically unsound. We need one that's empirically realistic and logically sound. And until we get it, we need to teach every school of thought, not just neoclassical, but teach Austrian which I'm no great fan of, but they have, they have insights that you don't, won't find in post-Keynesian economics that I'm more of a fan of. The post-Keynesian economics doesn't have anything really decent about ecological economics, so you have to have a whole range of different areas being taught. And in, in that situation, and I, I've just read a, a recent book by a physicist called George Cooper making the argument about Ptolemy's theory of, of the cosmos, again, the, the same analogy that I've made, um, but we need to teach neoclassical economics, a bit like Ptolemy would have been taught after Copernicus. An interesting, clever, but mad model. It's neat, it's plausible, and it's wrong. Okay? And we need to get past that and admit that it's, it's wrong and move on. So we need a Copernican replacement, but in the meantime you have to learn all the theories of economics. And if you don't get them at your university, then just come and join me in Kingston. <laughs> Thanks.
Thanks very much.